the record will show the presence of the defendant and all counsel. The jury is not present. We are completing the hearing we began this morning. The witness has had an opportunity to review Exhibit 604. Ms. Wilmot, you may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. LaMila, have you had a chance to review the interview between uh, Detective Flores and Bill Arias? Yes, I did. And were you able to view the entire interview? I, uh, yes, I did. And specifically, you were asked questions earlier by the prosecutor about a nine-second clip of that interview. Did you, did, were you able to put that nine-second clip into context? Yes, I was. And putting that into context, did you, uh, do you see that right prior to that, that, he, that the interview, uh, Mr. Arias is talking about uh, Jody as a teenager? Yes. And that Jody was uh, in trouble with her parents? Yes. Because she had marijuana? Yes. And because she was in trouble, did they search her room? Yes. And that after that, is Mr. Arias describing after that he, that they searched her room, that Jody felt like they were nosy parents? Yes. And after that, she, she hid things from them, didn't talk to them? Absolutely. And, and then after all of this context we talk about, after that is where we hear the nine second clip about uh, since, since she started not talking to them as much that she basically, the nine second clip that she lied to them since then and she was about 14 then. Yes. Uh, putting that in context with what Mr. Arias was talking about as um, Jody as a teenager, does this, does this make any difference to you in your ultimate assessment of domestic violence? No, it doesn't. Does it, something that she did as a 14 year old girl uh, as a teenager with her parents, does that have anything to do with the, or change any of the evidence that you've seen with regard to her truthfulness when you're assessing a relationship between Ms. Arias and Mr. Alexander? No, it doesn't. Does it either help or hurt your assessment? It neither hurts or helps my assessment. All right, thank you. Anything else? Just hard to All right. Irrespective of what Ms. Violet may say, and with due respect to her position, this appears to be a case where there was shoddy work that was done on her behalf. And one of the aspects of that shoddy work that she did is in taking the defendant's word in this case about the events. There was only one person that she talked to, the defendant, and that was for 44 hours. Uh, in gauging or in looking at that statement provided to her by the defendant, this person made the assessment that she was telling the truth. Anything that goes to whether or not the defendant was telling the truth is relevant. I understand that she says that it didn't factor into her assessment, but that's not the inquiry. The inquiry is whether or not there's something out there that may be considered or may cast doubt upon her opinion. 
certainly the fact that we have um, evidence already that at that time, at around the age of 14, the defendant saw herself as a victim and never was the victim of abuse, according to the evidence that you just received. It's about that same time that this defendant then begins to be dishonest with her father. And it's even though this witness here says it, it didn't affect my opinion, that may be so. That may, that may be legitimately what she believes, but her opinion is flawed. And it's a flawed because she took the defendant's statements into account without really filtering them adequately for the truth. And so I believe that it is relevant and should come in. This absolute, this nine-second clip absolutely is not relevant, and in fact, it's overly prejudicial under 414-2043. The reason being is, first of all, the state is continually trying to characterize or mischaracterize Ms. LaViolette's testimony by claiming that she only took into account Ms. Arias's uh, words during her interviews. That is not the case, and I don't know how often Ms. LaViolette can say it that it, it's going to change anything because she keeps continuing to tell the prosecutor that not only did she take into account what Miss Arias told her, she took into account multiple levels of information, including Mr. Alexander's own words. She also talks about the fact that there is no evidence at the time that she's assessing this domestic violence abusive relationship, there is no evidence that Miss Arias was being deceitful in any way. In fact, she's talked about the only person who's deceitful has been Mr. Alexander during this time. So. And the second thing is that the state talks about, um, continues to mischaracterize the evidence that Ms. Arias was not a victim of abuse. There is no such evidence. In fact, the evidence is quite contrary to that, that she was a victim of abuse as a child. So that state should be precluded from continuing to say that as though it's true, because it's not. The um, fact that there is something, this one tiny little piece of information from her father, a father who quite frankly has a motive to not be truthful because he's the one who was abusive, a motive to not paint Miss Arias in a, in a good light because of what he has done to Miss Arias. This tiny little piece of information that we have is not relevant as you heard to Miss LaViolette's assessment that she did um, 14 years, started 14 years later. So the fact that a teenager was not truthful with her parents at some point has nothing to do with whether or not her assessment was be, is flawed. It doesn't, it doesn't weigh. And the fact is, is the state wants to talk about that there is something out there that could ultimately go to Ms. Arias' credibility. But that's not how the rules work. And the law is, and evidence is weighed, that if there is something that is so long ago in time and so minute in detail, there is nothing to support it other than what um, this nine second clip. If it's so minute in detail, that means it's not relevant. And if there is any relevance, it's outweighed by, its, um, unfair, preju uh, by unfair prejudice. Based on that, I'd ask you to conclude it. All right, the objection to exhibit 604 is sustained. However, the state may inquire about the substance in that clip and whether it would have made a difference to this witness in formulating her opinion. Let me just have a clarification then as to how the state may inquire so that we, we don't get outside of your ruling. What is, what, is, what is, you're saying that the state may not get into the details, but what is the state allowed to ask then? Well, the state is allowed to ask uh, if she has viewed this clip and she's aware of the statement made by the defendant's father and if it would have affected her opinion. So nothing about what the statement of the father was? Yes. Okay. No, he may inquire about the statement of the father, but just not the circumstances that she opined or that the father opined about the defendant's truthfulness and whether that would have affected her opinion. So he's a lot... So the state's allowed to ask about, about the father making a statement as to Ms. Darius' truthfulness? Yes, but not the circumstances. Well, the problem I see with that, Judge, is that then it, it makes it sound like it's more important than it is. If, he's, if the state's allowed to talk about her own father talking about her truthfulness, because it's a tr truthfulness as a teenager. It's similar to the restrictions that were placed on this witness with regard 
to other information she considered informing her opinion. If you're going, if you're not going to object to the prosecutor putting in the tape or having her explain it, then that can happen. But I believe that the state is entitled to question the witness about this aspect in light of her prior testimony regarding what she considered important in forming her opinion about the defendant's truthfulness or credibility. Okay, I, I'm not asking for details, but what I would ask is that it just be qualified so that it's an accurate statement that the father made, her father made a comment about her truthfulness as a teenager. So that it's put in appropriate context. From the state, what do you intend to, to elicit with regard to Exhibit 604? I would like to ask. Oh, hold on. Go ahead. If she has reviewed this clip, that this clip indicates or involves the father and that the father uh, has questions as to whether, as to the defendant's truthfulness uh, and that this statement involves the defendant at the age of 14. That's fine, Judge. Okay. Bring in the jury. We'll show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Martinez, you may continue. Ma'am, uh, you've had a chance to review a statement by uh, the defendant's father to Detective Flores, correct? Correct. And specifically, you have had a chance to review a portion of that statement involving the father's um, characterization of his daughter in, truth of her, in terms of her truthfulness, correct? Correct. And he... In and there is an issue with regard to her truthfulness with regard to the father, correct? Involving the defendant. Correct. And this issue that he has with her truthfulness is referenced with regard to the age of 14, correct? And onward. Correct. The issue that we discussed previously involving the defendant being a victim, uh, of a, portraying herself as a victim, even though there was no abuse, isn't it? Approach, please. And in 609, we talked about an interview with Zena Carranza, right? Correct. And she's the one that talks about whether or not the defendant likes to play the victim, right? Correct. And one of the things that you told us about this particular incident was that this was when they were teenagers that she was referencing this, correct? It was actually when she was younger than that. Well, you indicated previously when you testified that they were teenagers, yes or no? I thought they were teenagers. I was incorrect. Well, ma'am, isn't it true that that's what you told us previously? That's all yes, I meant. Yes, it is true. And so this 
indication that you gave previously that they were teenagers is about the same time that the father made the statement about his daughter's lack of truthfulness, correct? Objection, foundation, knowledge. Overruled. Right? I gave the wrong age, Mr. Martinez. I'm not asking you that, am I? Well, you're asking me to put those two things together, Mr. Martinez. Isn't it true that previously, before the break, and whatever it is that you did during the break, you took... Previous to the break, you testified that this incident involving Zena Carranzo occurred when they were teenagers, yes or no? Yes, I did testify to that. And isn't it true that the father's statement about the lack of truthfulness references the, the age of 14, correct? Yes, but I... I understand that, thank you. Now, ma'am, with regard to um, certain things, you also, you told us with regard to the interview that um, you did go back and you did talk to the defendant about certain things, right? Specifically the anal sex, right? I talked to her about the lubricant. No, but my question is, do you remember that we played the clip? And yes. the clip involved anal sex, right? Right. And you told us before the break, well, I went back and I talked to her about the anal sex, right? I talked to her about the anal sex. And so you did go back then and you talked to her sometime afterwards, right? Specifically about the lubricant. When you say specifically about the, lub about the lubricant, you didn't talk to her about the anal sex then? I, I talked to her about who brought the lubricant as you asked me in our interview, who brought the, that you thought was important, so I went back and asked her about who brought the lubricant for the anal sex. I, I'm, I'm not interested in who brought the lubricant right now. Okay. I'm interested in your knowledge about the defendant's uh, dalliance or uh, activities in anal sex. That's what I'm interested in. All right. With regard to that particular activity, did you go back and address that issue with the defendant to get the specifics about that? Or did your prejudices prevent you from doing that? Objection, argument. Sustained. Well, you said that you were old-fashioned, right? Yes. And did the fact, or was the fact that you were old-fashioned prevent you from going back and talking to the defendant about the various instances of anal sex? With whom? With whomever she was having anal sex. There were different people that she tried. She tried anal sex. She didn't like it. And so Mr. But, but, Alexander, as far as I know, is the only person that she had repeated <coughs> anal sex with. But my question to you is, did you go back and talk to her about her activities involving anal sex Yes or no? I, I asked her about anal sex. Yes or no? Yes, I asked her about so anal sex. So you went back, and after you went back to talk to her about anal sex, did you talk to her about the anal sex involving all these other individuals, or did you just talk to her about anal sex involving Mr. Alexander? Her, I talked to her about anal sex with other people. With regard to those other people, did she ever indicate to you that she had anal sex with Mr. Juarez? I did not talk to her about Mr. Juarez. So do you know whether or not she had anal sex with Mr. Juarez? No, I do not. Do you know? No, I do not. Would it be important in terms of this, to see who's assertive, to determine who initiated the anal sex if she in fact had it with Mr. Juarez? Would that have been important to you? It's not important in assessing the domestic so the violence. No. It's not important in assessing domestic violence, which is really what I was asked to do here. So the answer is no. The answer is no, correct? It would be irrelevant. Right. And with regard to Mr. McCartney, do you know whether or not she had anal sex with Mr. McCartney? She said... She said... She said that, that they had attempted anal sex and, and she didn't like it. How about with Mr. Brewer? Did you talk to her about having anal sex with Mr. Brewer? That they were 
experimented and tried it, and it was not something that either one of them pursued, nor did she pursue it with, with Mr. McCartney. But there was at least two, as far as you know, there were two attempts at it, correct? Is the way, is that what you're telling me? There were attempts. Right, I used the word attempts. So there were yeah. two attempts, correct? Mm -hmm. And they never went anywhere, I guess is, is the point. In other words, they, it wasn't consummated, for lack of a better term. It wasn't pursued. And they didn't go forward with it, right? They didn't continue having anal sex. Are you saying they only had it once and didn't continue having it? I don't know how many times they had it. That was not relevant. What was relevant was that it was not enjoyable and they did not continue it as a practice. And that illustrates that if there's an area out there to discuss and you don't think it's important, then you won't discuss it, right? If it doesn't feel relevant to the domestic violence aspect of it, because I was retained to look at domestic violence. That's what I did, Mr. Martinez. I looked at domestic violence. So if it doesn't feel relevant, then it's a feeling that you have about whether or not it's relevant. And if it doesn't feel relevant, then you don't pursue it, right? If it isn't relevant, I don't pursue it. You use the word feel. Do you remember just using that? If it isn't relevant, I don't pursue it. And the person who makes the determination the gatekeeper about whether or not it's relevant is you, right? In my, in my assessment of domestic violence, I would be the person. Right. It would be in what you, in your mind, believe is important, right? What me and my experience believe is important. Sure. You, your mind, your experience believe is important, correct? Correct. It could be that others may disagree with you about what is or isn't important, right? Yes. Correct? It could, sure. And it could also be that you may be mistaken as to what you think is important or not important, correct? Objection, declaration. Anybody can be wrong. I'm not asking about anybody. I'm asking about you. Anybody can be wrong. How about you? Is that a yes? I'm sure I could be wrong. And so in this particular case, it could be that with regard to this aspect of the anal sex and who she had it with and how it was, it was initiated, it could be that you could be wrong about its importance, correct? I don't believe I am. I know you don't believe that you are, but it could be, correct? Objection, speculation. I'll do it. Hypothetically, anything could be true, Mr. Martinez. But you're saying in this case it isn't, right? I'm saying I don't believe that it is. One of the other aspects that um, we discussed or that you believe is that there, you are aware of the telephone uh, conversation involving the defendant and Mr. Alexander where they are involved in sex. Yes. Right? And you indicated that you listened to that, correct? Yes. Did you listen to it before or after my interview with you? I don't remember. But you listen to it, and um, it's your impression that that was tape recorded by Mr. Alexander, correct? Uh, I believe it was tape recorded by Ms. Arias. Do you remember that you and I had a conversation about that, this interview back on, in November of 2000, and I'll give you the exact date. 2004, November, November 14th of 2012. Do you remember that we had a conversation about that on November 14th of 2012? Yes. And during that time, we discussed who, your understanding of who had taped that conversation, right? Yes. Do you remember that you gave me a different answer? You've got the paper there. Yes I've or no? The... I'm asking what you remember, ma'am. Do you remember giving... I don't remember. I don't remember. So the answer is you don't remember giving me a different answer. I don't remember giving you a different answer, but I believe that what you've got on that paper is correct, and I could have, because I didn't know everything when I had that interview with you. Ma'am, you had already formed an opinion when I interviewed you back in November 14th of 2012, right? I, f I formed a partial. No, do you remember that we discussed it and you said that you already had an opinion? Do you I had an opinion you? about domestic violence, and yes, I did. And in fact, you, do you know what date this trial started? Do you know? What date this trial started? Right. 
It started at the beginning of this year. No, didn't jury selection, do you know? Well, that? jury selection started in December. Of what year? Last year. What year? Give us, is it 2012? 2012. Right. And in December, barely a month before this trial was to start, you and I discussed your opinion, didn't we? In November. Yes, about a month before this trial was to start, right? Yes. And during that time, you gave me all the information that you had at that point, didn't you? Exactly. So what you're saying is you had already done all of this work, you already had reached your opinion, and yet you then went and did some other work? I did some other work. Why is it that when you spoke to me, you already had the uh, impression, or not the impression, the opinion that the defendant was a victim of domestic violence? Because I had read numerous, what it, in the paper, and I'm not sure which is the I am and which is the test. I had, read re I had read a lot of written material. I had looked at a lot of the collateral. I read, read the collateral data. And I believed I had enough information. But I hadn't read everything. I, I think I hadn't read some of the text messages or something. I hadn't read everything. But if you already had an opinion, then what's the purpose of going to continue doing an assessment in this case after the if, after you and the prosecutor had an interview? Because the more information I can get, the better. And if I find uh, confounding information or I find something, but the more information I have, the better to create a better context. So I continue to collect information as long as I can. So are you saying that when you spoke to the prosecutor in November 2012, you were unprepared to give an opinion as to whether or not the defendant uh, suffered from domestic violence in this case? No, I didn't say that. Your opinion was complete when we spoke. You said, isn't it true, that in your opinion, the defendant was a victim of domestic violence, right? Correct. And you had reviewed whatever it was that you had reviewed up to that time, right? Correct. And you had looked at all of the corroboration that you that was that you had taken a look at, right? Correct. And based on all of that, you and I had this discussion, right? Yes, we did. And it's an absolute opinion that you had. In other words, you weren't waffling when you spoke to the prosecutor about this. You were certain of your opinion back in November 2012, right? Yes, I was. If you're already certain about your opinion when you're talking to the prosecutor, what's the purpose of going back? Well, let me do, there is no purpose served in going back and doing more work on this case if you already have an opinion, is there? There is to me. How can that possibly be if you've already reached an opinion? You, that's an absolute, the more isn't? information I have, the better off I am. The more information I have, it just keeps being helpful to add information. I do that in all my cases. I don't stop gathering information. Let's talk about the telephone call. That wasn't new information to you at the time that you spoke to the prosecutor in November of 2012, was it? No. You knew about it, right? Correct. And at that time, isn't it true that you told the prosecutor that the person who actually had tape recorded that conversation was Mr. Alexander? Do you remember telling? That I thought it was. Well, everything can be prefaced with I think. Wouldn't you agree? I don't have, I don't have a historical record much like you have right there to refer to. I made some verbal mistakes I'm, in my interview with you, and I am more than willing to say that. I'm more I'm than willing to say that I misspoke. It is not information I got from Ms. Arias. I looked at it later because of our interview. And what you're saying when you're saying that you made mistakes is that you were not paying attention to detail in this case because you were already in the defendant's camp. It didn't matter to you to pay attention to this stuff. Objection, Did it matter to you to pay attention to this stuff and be precise about it at that point? What mattered to me, Mr. Martinez, yes or no? what mattered was context, Mr. Martinez. Yes. Or the no. big picture mattered to me, Mr. Martinez. The big picture. 
all of the evidence. Does the date matter to me? Not as much as what Objection happens. Objection not responsive. Okay. I'm asking you about a telephone call. I'm not asking you about the date of the telephone call, am I? No, you're not. I'm asking about your knowledge as to who recorded it, right? And I have answered that. You've answered it, but you've also said that you made a mistake, right? I made a mistake in who made the recording. Yes, I and did. And if you made a mistake about that, something that, that in your review of all of this case, isn't it true that that is the only piece of evidence that we have where Mr. Alexander is actually present and you can actually hear what he's saying, right? Where I can actually hear his voice? Yes. Yes. And you're the person that told us that in terms of the clinical interview and people talking, 90% is body language, right? You told us that previously, right? Right. If we can't get the body language, at least you can get the inflections from that telephone call, can't you? Yes. That's better than looking at a text message where you claim that Mr. Alexander may have been mistaken when he wrote down a name, right? There are lots of text messages. Ma'am, we discussed a text message yesterday. Do you remember that? In which yes. you indicated that you thought that Mr. Alexander had written the wrong name. Do you remember that? Yes. So this telephone call is much better evidence, if you will, because you can see the, or hear the interaction between the two of them, right? That doesn't necessarily make it better. It makes it different, but it doesn't necessarily make it better. So you would rather have a written document than a recorded conversation is what you're saying? I'm saying that a recorded sex tape does not necessarily have to be accurate, any more accurate, but when you look at a compilation, a lot of text messages, a lot of IMs, a lot of Gmails, that you get a lot more information. I'm not denying that it was important to hear his voice and to hear the exchange. And in terms of the comparative analysis between that exchange between the defendant and Mr. Alexander, the person she ultimately killed, you're saying that that information there is as good maybe less than as good as something in writing? Objection is the testimony. Overall, to me, answer. Can you repeat the question? Which is better, this tape-recorded conversation or a text message? Which, which one? I can't say which is better. In your assessment in this case, you can't say which one is better, right? I'm saying that there's a, there's a large number of text messages. There's a large number of IMs. There is one sex tape that I listen to. So if you ask me to weigh and ask me what's more important, I'd have to say they're important, but I have to take all of that information in. And that's how you approach this case, where you have something that's as vital as Mr. Alexander talking. When you have Mr. Alexander talking, you can hear in, in the tone of his voice whether he's happy or unhappy, can't you? Whether he's happy or unhappy? Right. You can hear what he presents, certainly. Well, it's what he presents, but you're, one of the things that you did is you talked to the defendant, and she presented that evidence to you by talking to you, right? Correct. So now, when Mr. Alexander is talking, he's presenting to you. He doesn't know it, but he's presenting to you, right? Yes, he is. And that's even better than what the defendant is presenting to you, because... He doesn't have the issue of secondary gain there, does he? It depends on how you look at it. Well, no, I'm asking about your definition of secondary gain. Do you remember we talked about that previously? Secondary gain? I certainly do. That if it's within the individual's uh, point of view that something is going to be beneficial to them, then there's this issue that they may be deceitful, right? There's secondary gain in a sex tape. I'm not asking you about that right now. We're talking to you about secondary gain, just itself, correct? Well, and secondary gain, secondary gain is not only part of 
whether somebody is going to get something from an expert witness or an attorney. Secondary gain also implies um, what you're going to get when you're having a sexual encounter with somebody. So, so there's. So you're equating in this case an individual who is charged with a very serious crime with somebody who may be, maybe talking about masturbation? You're equating that and saying, well, they both have the same reason I to be not, deceitful. I did not say that. Well, that's what you indicated. Are you saying that Mr. Alexander, when he was speaking with the defendant, was in the same relationship as you were with the defendant when you were speaking to her? If you were in my group, I would ask you to take a time out, Mr. Martinez. Judge, would you please admonish the witness to yes. withhold those comments and ask the attorney to disregard the outburst? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, disregard the witness's last statement. Ms. LaViolette, please just answer the questions. Isn't it true, ma'am, that the relationship between you and Mr. and Ms. Arias, when you were asking the questions and you were talking to her, is different than the relationship between Mr. Alexander and the defendant when they were having this telephone conversation back on May 10th of 2008? Yes, it is. They were being intimate in that conversation, weren't they? They were being sexual. I don't know how intimate they were being. They were being tender to each other, weren't they? There was a tenderness. And there was a feeling, if you will, that they were getting along there, correct? Correct. There was no indication from the tape itself that Miss Arias wasn't enjoying herself as much as Mr. Alexander, right? No, there was no indication. They were both enjoying each other carnally if only connected through wireless space, correct? I can't speak to how much someone was enjoying it on a sex tape. Well, particularly I, a female. I'm not asking about do you for you to quantify it. There is there are indications there that Miss Arias is having a, an orgasm on two occasions, right? Correct. So she has an orgasm on two occasions and he has an orgasm on one occasion, right? Yes. So, um, based on that, it is clear that they're enjoying each other, correct? Objection. Objection. Overruled. Have you seen When Harry Met Sally? I'm not asking you about that, ma'am. I'm asking you whether or not they're enjoying themselves. I can't tell whether she's having an orgasm or not. So that I can tell that, that she's... So that means then you can't tell if he's having an orgasm either, right? No. So you're saying that, as you said here, it, they may have had an orgasm or they may not have had an orgasm, right? They were at least acting like they had an orgasm. Both of them were acting, right? Yes. They were, they were acting as they had an orgasm. I don't know what they had. But there's really no indication from any collateral source that, for example, the defendant was not having an orgasm. You don't have any information from any other source that says she wasn't, right? No, I don't. You don't have any information from any other collateral source that says he wasn't having an orgasm, right? No. So why is it that you are now choosing to interpose a belief that, for example, Mr. Alexander was not having an orgasm if there is nothing out there to support that? Objection. I'm Sustained. What leads you to believe that Mr. Alexander was not having an orgasm? You know, once again, my expertise is in domestic violence, not in orgasms. Then and why did you answer the question you, the way you did if you're not an expert in orgasms? Because you asked me questions so quickly, and I really should stand back and think about them, because those questions are not within the sphere of what I actually was retained to do, which was assess domestic violence. Or it could be that, as you sit out there, you're advocating on behalf of the defendant, and you're only presenting things that benefit her. Objection. <coughs> Correct? I, it was, it was. This conversation where they are both talking, you told me that you believed that it was Mr. Alexander that tape recorded it, correct? Correct. And that's because of your biases and because you were, if you will, in favor of the defendant 
That would seem more appropriate to you, correct? No, I just misspoke. You just misspoke, but you had no basis for misspeaking, correct? Probably, I did not. You could have properly said, I don't know, correct? Yes, I could have. And, but instead, you chose to cast aspersions, if you will, on Mr. Alexander. Objection. Uh, Objection. Uh, oh, you may answer. I didn't believe that was casting aspersions. I believed that I didn't. I didn't believe whoever taped it was a problem. I believed that they were both participating. So I didn't think that was problematic. That he would, just, whether he did it or whether she did it. Just Listen. like the text message before that we discussed that involved the names of those two women. Do you remember that, that we discussed that yesterday? Yes. Rather than saying, well, it could be that the defendant lied to Mr. Alexander, you immediately went to the fallback position that Mr. Alexander perhaps typed the wrong name. Do you remember telling me that yesterday? Yes. Every time that there's been a judgment call in this case, you have taken the defendant's side, correct? I'm not sure that I have. Well, on those two occasions you did, right? On two occasions I did. And I, and I don't think of it as taking someone's side because I don't think that who taped the thing was, was a critical issue. I didn't think it cast aspersions on either Mr. Alexander or Ms. Arias. I just thought they consensually did a, a sex tape and that that wasn't a really important aspect as, as to who, who did it. And I probably just should have said I don't know. Well, you had had information previous to that that the, that the defendant really only had sex with Mr. Alexander to please him. You had that information, didn't you? No. That you never heard that the defendant felt uncomfortable when she was engaging in sex with Mr. Alexander? And I also heard that she I felt comfortable. Mm -hmm. Foundation went sustained. As part of your investigation in this case, did you review several sexual encounters involving the defendant and Mr. Alexander? Yes. And with regard to the first sexual encounter, what is your understanding of the first sexual encounter? What kind of sex act was involved? It was oral sex, and she was uncomfortable with it being too soon. Ma'am, so it was oral sex, and she was uncomfortable with it being too soon. Where did this oral sex take place? The oral sex took place um, in the, the home of the Hughes. And that's the first time that they ever had this oral sex, right? As, yes. With regard to this oral sex, you said, well, she felt uncomfortable, right? Yes. So if we then listen to the tape, was there any indication there that she was uncomfortable with any of the phrases that were being used? Overall, you may continue. Your assessment of the tape, you don't see anything 
indicating that she, the uh, defendant is uncomfortable in any way, do you? You mean seven months later? No, I mean on May 10th of 2008. So seven seven so months after she said she was uncomfortable? All right, if you want to say seven months after she was uncomfortable, let's go with seven months. Yeah, seven months after she was uncomfortable. I don't see discomfort in, in the tape on, of 510, if that's what you're asking. And, and ma'am, just for the purposes of the math here, if that happened in May of 2008, would you agree then that uh, seven months before that would be November of 2007, correct? Correct. And uh, no, no, I'm sorry. No, so, so, so it was November of uh, 2006 when they first had the sexual encounter, so it's quite a bit prior to that. Part of the reason that I point that out is that it appears that you seem to jump to um, a conclusion when, when you're answering these questions, and, and, and in, like in this case, you were mistaken, wouldn't you agree? Objection, I gave. Overruled. That I gave the wrong date, the seven months? You were, you were mistaken, weren't you? Yes, and I remembered quickly that it was November 6th. No, you didn't remember quickly. Actually, the prosecutor prompted you, correct? Objection, mm -hmm. Overruled. Isn't that how it worked? I didn't feel prompted by you, but uh, okay, if you want to prompt well, me, no. that's fine. Didn't the prosecutor indicate to you May 2008, and just for purposes of clarification, he then indicated it was November 2007. Do you remember that exchange and just then, now? Yes, and then I yes said... Or no. then, yes or no? Yes or no? I said... Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Now, ma'am, one of the other things about the interview that you had with the defendant is that you had these issues with regard to what she told you, but you also prompted her with leading questions, didn't you? I don't believe I did. You, pro you suggested some answers, didn't you? Are, Are you, you talking, talking about... Objection overruled. You may answer yes or no. I, I don't... I mean, I interviewed her over 44 hours, so I'm not sure. I try very, or very hard not to lead people. Well, do you remember that with regard to her, one of the things involving sex was that you had an issue or a question as to whether or not the defendant or, or Mr. or the defendant, yes, isn't it true that you wanted to know from Ms. Al from Ms. Arias whether or not she used sex to quell his anger. That is your question, right? Yes. And those are your words, right? Yes, but I think she had already mentioned that to me. And well, I was just... if she had already mentioned it to you, then why did you feel the need to ask her about it? You know, that was a long time ago. I, well, then I, don't, maybe we I can... don't know. I, well, I really don't know. I can't tell you. Let's take a look at your notes about what you wanted to ask. All right. Objection, judge, judge. Uh, Take a look at Exhibit Sure. That's your writing, correct? Yes, it is. And um, at the top of the page, it, it indicates, ask Jody, right? Yes. These are the questions that you wanted to ask her, correct? Correct. And in fact, there are more than one or two questions there, correct? Yes. yes and, and none of these questions, if you will, have a question mark after them, do they? No, I, I guess not. Well, no, let's just take a look at the first one and read that. 
Well, just read the whole document to see there are no question marks. No, there aren't any question marks. But you do say that you want to ask Jody about this, correct? Correct. This is part of your investigation into this case, right? Yes. And one of the things that you wanted to ask Jody was, did you use sex to quell his anger, right? Yes. So that was your, if you will, question to the defendant, correct? It was my question. Yes. And so you were leading her or suggesting the answer there, weren't you? I didn't feel that I was. I know you don't feel that you were, but isn't it true that you're saying, did you use sex to quell his anger, right? You're speaking specifically about anger in that question, right? It was uh, after. You may. Continue. Isn't it true that you were suggesting the answer there when you were talking about anger? I was basing it on information that I had gotten from journals and other information, and I was putting it together, and I was asking the question because it appeared that that was happening. So but the answer so is... So I, I did ask that question. I did yeah, ask yes that question. No, you, you, isn't it true then that you did suggest the answer of... Did you use sex to quell his anger? You suggested an answer there, right? I guess I did. And you also asked whether or not distress to Travis means sex, right? I believe that might have been an answer and not, and that was an answer to that question, not a, um, not a question. Actually, that's not the way it's written. Take a look at, um, Way it's written. It said distress to Travis meant sex. I think that is the answer to that question. And at the top of this page, it also says ask Jody, right? Right, but you. Yes or no? It does say that at the top, right? They weren't all questions. I, I do sort of stream of consciousness, so I don't. I ask Jody questions, I get answers, I might put them on the same page. I just want to clarify that. How is it that you are saying that you are putting some other questions on this page, other answers on this page, when they're clearly all questions here? Objection mischaracterizes her testimony. Oh, you mean? Right under, did you use, did he use, or did you use um, sex to quell his anger? I have an answer, distress to Travis meant, meant sex. That was an answer to that question. So you provided your own answer to the question then. That's what you're saying. No. Right? It was a question I asked Ms. Arias, and so I I write on on the papers that I write questions on, I write answers on, I write other things on. So it's not clearly just all questions, it's not clearly just all answers. I intersperse things. Ma'am, isn't it true that at the top of this page it says, ask Jody, correct? Correct. And then there are a number of writings underneath there, right? Correct. You're not saying that as you're sitting there talking to the defendant, you're writing down, ask Jody, are you? No, I'm not. This is something that was done in advance, isn't it? The question was, yes. This document was done in advance, wasn't it? Yes. And so, when you say that, well, I write the responses, how could the responses be there if you're doing this document in advance? I wasn't doing all that. Mr. Martinez? Yes or no? Yes or no? Was 
isn't it true that all of these questions were written in advance? The, the, the original question was not a yes or no question. Or did not request a yes or no answer. All right. Your objection is noted. Overruled. You may answer the question. The question is correct. I Thank wrote. You. Thank you. Now, one of the other things that you told us is that you reviewed all of the, or a lot of the defendant's journals, right? Yes. And that um, these journals, if you will, were guided by this law that she believed in that if you when you write something in there that you should write something positive and not anything negative, correct? That you should try to focus on the positive. Right. And what's that law called again? The law of attraction. So this law of attraction, according to you, uh, the way that, and you've had some information that you received upside and apart from what the defendant gave you, correct? Well, I watched The Secret. That's it. So The Secret is a movie, right? Correct. And in it, it talks about, or it is about the law of attraction, right? Yes, and so there's a documentary, and I don't remember the name of that. But you didn't watch the documentary, correct? No, I watched the documentary as well. Oh, you did. And then you also spoke to the defendant about the law of attraction, correct? Correct. And that is what encompasses your knowledge of the law of attraction, correct? Correct. And the law of attraction, as you've defined it for me, is that if you write something positive, Positive things will happen, correct? No, not, it's not that simple. Go ahead and tell me what you believe the law of attraction is. That that's part of it, that the energy you put out in a positive way comes back to you. So you should think in a positive way, write in a positive way. Um, and this was a, a documentary done by physicists and they were talking about positive energy and all of the energy, you know, the energy coming back to you. And one of the things you just mentioned to us is writing in a positive way, right? Correct. And so, for example, this is what you applied in reading the defendant's journals, that she was influenced by this law of attraction, correct? Correct. And so that, according to you, she wouldn't write anything negative in that journal because it would go against the law of attraction, right? No, I didn't say that. Well, isn't it true that we talked about, or you talked to the defense counsel about situations as to whether or not there was anything negative about Mr. Alexander? Do you remember talking about that? Yes, and there were and, several things yes. that were negative. And you also were asked about certain events that occurred in their life, for example, when she alleges that he hit her? Do you yes. remember that? Yes. And you said, well, because of the law of attraction, it made sense to you that those wouldn't be written in the journal, right? Yes, I, I believe. I, I, I don't think that's the only reason, but yes. That's part of the reason. And, sure. and uh, it, based on what you know about the law of attraction, you would not expect her to write anything negative in her journals because it would be contrary to that law of attraction, right? No, I would expect that even when you have a philosophy of the law of attraction, that you're not always able to maintain it. Okay, so in this case, though, with regard to writing negative things, you did not find anything in those journals indicating that Mr. Alexander ever laid a finger on the defendant, correct? Objection is characterized as a testimony. Overruled. You may answer. Correct? Correct. But you still believe the defendant, though, right? Based, that, based on other things. And those things are her statements, right? Those things are Mr. Well, no, no, no. Let's do this. You believe it in part because of her statements, right? In you part. You also believe it in part because of the law of attraction, attraction right? right? I believe that, that she didn't write in it because of the law of attraction, or I believe that she he was, never laid a finger on her. You believe that the reason that she didn't write these things in her journals, as you explained it on direct examination, is because in part she's an adherent to the law of attraction, correct? Correct. And that's how you tried, that's how you went behind, if you will, the written word, correct? Objection recommended. Overruled. I believed that 
that was a reason she didn't write in her journal. Right, and that's why you went behind the words that indicated otherwise, right? The words never indicated that he ever hit her, correct? Correct. The words never indicated that he ever choked her, correct? Correct. The words never indicated uh, any other physical act towards her, correct? Indicated cruel behavior, but I don't acts. know what that was. I, I don't know what that meant. I'm talking about acts. For example, did they cruel never... Cruel behavior would be an act. With regard to that, there was no indication that he ever hit her. Where is your understanding that he hit her on the day that she indicated that she was leaving? I have no indication other than her word. And, right, and what did she tell you? On, on the day she was leaving, wait a minute, on what day that she was leaving? She, remember that you talked about the uh, Mr. Alexander hitting the defendant on the day that she indicated she was going to move back to Wairika. Correct. Where did he hit her? He hit her on the jaw, on the... And, and that's the, and you got that information from the defendant, correct? Correct. Um, do you know somebody by the name of uh, Dan Freeman? Yes. Uh, and you're well, I don't know him. I just read a statement. I don't know him. And with regard to Dan Freeman, you know that he's somebody that's a friend to the defendant, right? Correct. And in that story that we're talking about, the one where she tells him she's going to go to Wairika, and there's this, it appears to be a backhand, correct? Correct. Uh, he's strikes out and lashes at her because he doesn't want her to leave, correct? Correct. Objection speculation as to Mr. Alexander, his reasoning behind hitting the state. Well, isn't that what the defendant told you? That Mr. Alexander hit her because she told him that she was going to go to Wairika. And that he was upset about it. Right. That's what she, that's what she told you, right? Correct. Again, my question to Dan Freeman, uh, do you know whether or not Mr. Freeman had a conversation with Mr. Alexander prior to this incident about whether or not Mr. Alexander wanted Miss Arias to even be around in the Mesa area? I have no information on that. Would it be important to get that side of the story if, hypothetically speaking, Mr. Freeman were to have testified that it was actually Mr. Alexander that was that had to have the talk with the defendant about breaking up and leaving. That would be information that I would like to have. Let's assume that that's the hypothetical, that Mr. Alexander actually didn't want anything else to do with the defendant, and he's the one that's pushing her away and telling her to leave. Objection is declaration. Pastor. Oh, Let's assume that, and assume that it's Mr. Alexander that's telling her that he wants her to leave. Wouldn't that be something that you would want to know in weighing whether or not what the defendant told you is true involving her statement about telling Mr. Alexander that she was going to Wairika? It's important, and I have no evidence to support what you're saying. Right, but let's assume hypothetically that that evidence does exist out there. I'm asking you to assume the truth of it. Assume well, that you're, that you're asking me to assume a hypothetical that I have no evidence of. Is that correct? And I'm assuming that, and I'm asking you to assume that hypothetical because that person, let's say, came into this court and said that. All right. Assume that. If all of that were true, wouldn't that cause a problem in your assessment of this case, because now at least, as to this alleged incident, it doesn't seem to be true. It would be important for me to have that information. You have that information. Now what are you gonna do with it? What am I gonna do with it? Yes, in terms of your opinion. Does that, Does that give you a sense of pause in the firmness of your opinion? It gives me information that I have to look at, that I have to check out. Does it globally change the picture of domestic violence in regard to the evidence that I have reviewed and seen? It doesn't mean that there was no domestic violence. So what you're saying, your opinion changes not, even though you have 
you, that new information were to be provided to you, right? That, that Mr. Alexander wanted Ms. Arias to leave? Yes, and go back to Wairika. There's also no evidence of that. I'm not saying that there's no evidence of that. I'm asking you to assume that Daniel Freeman came into this courtroom and said that, that he was there. If you had that, would that give you pause in terms of your opinion? I would. Yes or no? It's not a yes or no question. OK, Mr. then we'll move on. Yes. Now, with regard to this fight, do you remember about the tri that you told us about the trip to have a soup fight? Correct. And you spoke to the defendant about it, right? Correct. And what was her version of the trip to have a soup fight? Why don't you tell us what you know about the trip to have a soup fight and tell us who started it, if there was a fight? There was an, an argument. Between whom? Between Ms. Arias and Mr. Alexander. Where did it start? I don't know where it started. Uh, do you know how it started? There, I read two things. I read sure. something that, that the Freemans wrote. But I would like to look at uh, the information in well, the I, journal, I, because I got the information from a journal that I read. And uh, the specifics of that information, I can tell you the gist of that information. Why don't you give me the gist of that information? The gist of that information was they had a fight. They had an argument. Um, in fact, Lisa Andrews said he, he was very negative, that she thought he was overly negative reporting that trip. I'm asking, to I'm just asking, ma'am, I'm just asking about the trip itself. I don't want all this collateral uh, information that you want to provide. Okay. I want to know, for example, who started the fight, what was said during the fight, how long the fight lasted, and whether or not the defendant made any comments about the fight in her journal. That's sort of the information what I'm that I'm looking at. In the uh, objection, judge, he's just asking the gist. If he's going to go into detail, then the witness is requested to be able to review the document. All right, we're going to take the afternoon recess at this time, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before I release you for the afternoon break, <clears throat> the court is considering holding trial on Friday this week, this Friday, April 12, from 9.30 to 12.30. I'm also considering holding trial on April 26, that's a Friday, from 9 to 4, and on May 3rd, from 10 to 4. During the break, please look at your calendar, and when you come back, I'm going to ask you to let me know if any of those dates would cause a problem for you in being present. Yes. Yes, April 12, 9.30 to 12.30, April 26, from 9 to 4, and May 3rd, from 10 to 4. In addition, for your planning purposes, one of the jurors has a conflict this Thursday, so we will be starting trial at 10.30 instead of 9.30, so 10.30 this Thursday. And I know there is a request by another juror for two additional days. We are still discussing that. Any other questions about the schedule at this point? All right, you are excused. Please remember the admonition. <clears throat>